This is lecture 35. I'm going to be talking about California, my favorite state. I'm going to be talking about green guinea pigs and the economics of AB 32. I'm even going to bother to define what AB 32 is. Do you recognize that guy? So this is a picture from the cover of Newsweek from a few years ago when he was still governor. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger has the earth on his finger and it says save the planet or else. So back in 2006, uh, the Governor Schwarzenegger was not the Terminator. Hasta la vista, baby. He was saying to climate change. He signed into law to great fanfare. The New York Times celebrated this. Uh, liberal environmentalists everywhere celebrated that California was going to make a last stand. I believe that's the name of his new movie. A last stand against mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions. AB 32 is all about California's unilateral attempt to sharply reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's an open question. Is this folly or is this brilliant? And of course, I'm about to be talking about the green guinea pig. Leading intellectuals weighed in. Uh, who's that handsome guy in the middle of this blurry picture? Uh, so there were debates. Prop 23 a couple of years ago would have stopped AB 32, but it was defeated. And nerds like me in the middle of this picture, my colleague Ann Carlson from UCLA to the left, and from the Los Angeles Times, Margot Rosenfeld, Roosevelt, uh, all were participated in intellectual debates discussing the benefits and costs of this regulation. I'm a fan of AB 32, but it's important to be realistic about its intended and unintended consequences in a world where greenhouse gas emissions are rising everywhere else. There's three big pieces of this regulation that I want to talk about in this brief lecture. The regulation bundles many, many things, but uh, to boil it down to three dimensions, there's a cap-and-trade pollution permit market system for electric utilities and oil refineries, about 600 uh, stationary sources. There's a renewable portfolio standard of roughly 33%, meaning that in the future, while in the past a uh, large share of California's power came from natural gas, that share is going to shrink. We've never been a coal state, unlike Ohio or Illinois, but a growing share of electricity is going to have to be generated by wind or solar up to 33% under this renewable portfolio standard. And under these Pavley standards, vehicles are expected to become much more fuel efficient, put putting around and having a fuel economy of 40 to 50 miles per gallon, rather than the sort of anemic 27.5 at the federal level, even though President Obama has recently raised that, I believe, up to 35 pretty soon miles per gallon. So here's the classic supply and demand picture for pollution permit markets, and it highlights why economists love pollution permit markets so much. The key idea is counterfactual. If we didn't have pollution permit markets, polluters would effectively face a marginal price of zero. And when you face a price of zero, you're going to engage in a lot of act in activity, whether it's how much toilet paper you consume, how much beer you drink, uh, how much TV you watch. If you face a price of zero, you engage a lot of that. What a pollution permit market does is it sets a cap, that vertical supply curve you see, and then demanders demand these permits. The equilibrium price is set where demand crosses supply at this price 2008. And moving forward, polluters have to pay that price if they want to release a ton of carbon dioxide. That incentivizes them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and to seek out new solutions and to hire green nerds to take a new look at their production process to get the waste out, a la the Porter hypothesis. If you look at the area of that rectangle, so that Q2008 multiplied by P2008, that's also, that equals about $25 billion a year. And there's an interesting fight. With that money, California would certainly not have a budget deficit, and it could lower other distorting taxes like labor income taxes. It could also give that money back as a refund to all 40 million people in California. And in that case, even some Republicans would start to buy in. Uh, as you would be personally getting a check each year, sort of like Alaska with their negative state income tax. Many economic consultants who represent dirty refineries and other polluters say that these, uh, the revenue from these auctions should be given back to the polluters to minimize leakage, where leakage is the fancy word that if California unilaterally regulates carbon, while at competitor states like Nevada and Utah don't, there could be leakage of footloose dirty jobs moving to these other states as an unintended consequence of California's well-meaning actions. 
if these local polluters are freely allocated these permits, they would have less of an incentive to leave. So this is sort of uh, paying blackmail to some degree. And environmentalists get real righteous that they hate that. But um, if the firms have the right to locate where they want to locate, and if you've significantly raised their costs through pollution permit markets, then freely allocated allowances would be one strategy to, uh, to, to achieve the win-win of lower pollution without losing these California jobs. As all economists know, the joy of pollution permit markets is they create incentives for firms to become low-cost abating firms. You reward firms for being low-emitting firms. This encourages green research and development. It's a new set of rules of the game, shifting expectations. Given that factories are long-run, live, durable infrastructure, a factory can live for 30 or 40 years, if California firms expect that there will be a carbon market into the medium future, they have much stronger incentives to build a green facility that has lower emissions. And in this sense, government policies, a credible commitment to these policies, uh, create influence investment patterns and get us a greener capitalism. And that's certainly a good thing. Optimists claim that AB32 will create green jobs in the state. They have a vision of Tesla, electric vehicles, uh, wind power plants being developed here in collaboration with the research universities at UCLA, Stanford, Berkeley. It's certainly the case that we're going to demand green products in California because of AB32. But it's an open question why they must be produced here. I could imagine them being produced in China and India and through the supply chains then exported here. I think that environmental optimists have not been honest enough about the supply chains of why the production facilities are going to co-locate in the areas where they're demanded. That would happen in an urban economics model if transportation costs are very high or if there's sharp intellectual spillovers of having that activity here. If there's something specific about our research universities that there's a benefit of having the factories very close to the research nerds who are doing the research to make these new wind panels, solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles feasible. Now pessimists make some of their own slightly crazy claims. As I alluded to a moment ago, they say that liberal regulation, this AB 32, will unilaterally lead California to further de-industrialize. That while the regulation is well-meaning, the pessimists argue, they claim that the state's going to lose heavy industry to other states. Aaron Manser and I have a paper on this where we present a little bit of evidence supporting the claim that energy-intensive industries, when uh, do not locate in those areas with high electricity prices. So this raises the question how much California's RPS standard will raise electricity prices. But in California, California's economy is not intensive in energy intensive industries. Only a small share of California's jobs are in those energy intensive industries. So Aaron Manser and I are optimistic that AB 32, even if it raised industrial electricity prices, this won't lead to an exodus of incumbent jobs because there just aren't so many of these energy intensive jobs in this state in the first place. Two slides. I don't believe that AB 32 on its own can stop climate change. If you read through these slides, California is only California's emissions are only 2.5% of the world's emissions. So if AB 32 reduced our emissions to zero, uh, this would still be a drop in the bucket as India and China's emissions rise. So how can it be the case that I'm a fan of AB 32 while a realist about this algebra? And here's my final slide. It's the guinea pig effect. Back to Paul Romer and Robert Lucas, the Nobel laureate, ideas are public goods, and California is running a field experiment for the rest of the world. The ideas that don't work here won't be tried elsewhere, but the ideas that do work here can be implemented everywhere. In that sense, California is a hero for the rest of the world. I'm listening to a brown helicopter fly over. Whenever you know that you don't know something, you need someone to be a guinea pig, whether it's for experimental drugs or when a new restaurant opens. As we try to fight climate change and as we seek low-cost solutions, we don't know. We know that we don't know which solutions work. And you need someone or some place to be willing to experiment. Because of California's income, because of its liberalism and progressivism, California has stepped up as a hero here. And I talk about this at length in my interview, which you can click on for the address at the bottom of the slide.